Imagine a computer so powerful it could break every encryption on Earth. Now imagine it sitting there, useless, because we can't figure out how to program the darn thing. Welcome to the weird world of quantum computing, where the future is here, maybe. Hello, my quantum curious comrades. Theodore here, ready to take you on a wild ride through the topsy-turvy realm of quantum computing. We've got China flexing its quantum muscles, the U.S. potentially falling behind, and a whole lot of very smart people scratching their heads over how to make these super machines actually, you know, do stuff. Buckle up, because this is going to get weird. It seems like everywhere you turn these days, quantum computing is making headlines. <laughs> it's like it's going to revolutionize everything. Mm, right. But then you hear people saying it's all hype. <laughs> so which is it? Yeah, that's what we're diving into today, right? Exactly. So we've got a stack of articles here, yeah. different perspectives. And one big question, is quantum computing the real deal or is it just smoke and mirrors? And one article that really stood out to me mm -hmm. um, talks about how China is upping their quantum game. They've actually gone from producing five quantum computers simultaneously to eight. Wow. Can you believe that? Eight. That's a it's a bold move for yeah. sure. And it really signals something important, I think. They're not yeah. just building machines here. This is about something bigger. Yeah. China's making it clear that they're aiming to be a major player in quantum technology. Their Origin Wukong computer okay. uses their own Wukong chip, which has 72 qubits. Wow. That's not just impressive, it's a statement. Okay, so we're talking about 72 qubits. Yeah. Um, for our listeners who maybe don't know what a qubit even is, can you just give us a quick breakdown? Yeah, so think of the bits in your computer now. They can be a zero or a one, right? Right. A qubit is a bit different because of the strangeness of quantum mechanics. Okay. A qubit can be in what's called a superposition, yep. where it's both zero and one at the same time. It's kind of mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing. It's can... like having your cake and eating it, too. Yeah. And this is what makes quantum computing so powerful. Right. You entangle these qubits together. Okay. And you get an exponential increase in computing power. Yeah. Problems that would take normal computers years, even centuries, yeah. could be solved much faster. So back to China for a second, because they're making some big moves here. Hmm. What are the implications of this? Like, I know there's already a lot of, um, you know, tension globally around technology and leadership. It's a big deal. Whenever you have a technology that's potentially disruptive, yeah. it's going to change the balance of power. This could be the next space race. Only this time it's about controlling the future of computing. It's a fascinating thought. Yeah. So on one hand, we've got China ramping up production, talking about solving these complex problems faster than we ever thought possible. Yeah. But then we have the Boston Consulting Group, right? BCG, and they put out this report and they basically said, hold on, quantum computing hasn't actually outperformed classical computing in any really practical way yet. Welcome back to the deep dive. Right. And that's the thing, isn't it? That's the reality check we need. BCG. Yeah. They're a very respected group. Right. And their analysis really highlights the gap between the potential of quantum computing and where the technology actually is right now. So we've got this fascinating tension. The potential of quantum computing seems almost limitless. Yeah. But it hasn't really delivered on those promises yet, at least not in a practical way. What's it, holding it back? It really comes down to some pretty big hurdles, like in the technology itself. OK. And also in how well we really understand how to use it. OK. One of the biggest challenges is something called cribbit fidelity. Quibit fidelity. See, now you're going to lose me. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. OK, it's a little bit technical, I admit. Yeah. Basically, it refers to how well quibit can maintain its quantum state. OK. That whole being in zero and one and at the same time thing. Right. The problem is quibits are extremely sensitive okay. like to their environment. The slightest disturbance yeah. can knock it out of that state and cause errors in the calculations. So it's like trying to write with a pen and the ink color keeps changing? Exactly. It's going to be tough to get a clear message across. Well, that's a great way to put it. And the longer the computation, yeah. the more those errors can add up. And that makes it really hard to get reliable results. Okay, let's break this down. 
Quantum computers are like those know-it-all kids in class who can solve complex math problems in their head, except we're still figuring out how to ask them the right questions. It's like having a super genius alien land on Earth, and all we can think to ask is, hey, what's your favorite color? We've got the power, folks. We just don't know what to do with it yet. Right. Especially with these complex problems. Okay, so we've got these fragile quibits. That's one piece of it. Yeah. But you also mentioned understanding how to use quantum computing better. What did you mean by that? Well, even if we had these perfectly stable quibits, okay. we still need to know how to program them, right? Right. That's where quantum algorithms come in. Okay. These are instructions basically specifically designed to use the unique properties of quibits. Okay. And writing algorithms for a system that operates on the principles of quantum mechanics. Yeah. It's not easy. That sounds really complicated. It, it's like trying to write a recipe in a language you don't understand. Right. It's a totally different way of thinking about computation. Wow. Now, we have some amazing algorithms. Right. Like Shor's algorithm, yeah. which could be huge for cryptography. Okay. Or Grover's algorithm, which could really speed up database searches. Right. But developing new quantum algorithms and optimizing the ones we have for real world problems. Yeah. That's still a huge challenge. So where does that leave us? It feels like we're talking about these incredible potential applications. Mm -hmm. But then we've got these roadblocks. What's the outlook for quantum computing like in the near future? It's a tough question. Yeah. I think the reality is widespread practical applications. Yeah. Those are still probably a ways off. Welcome back to The Deep Dive. But that doesn't mean there aren't some really exciting developments happening right now. Like what? Give me some hope here. Well, for one thing, companies like Microsoft are putting a lot of resources into quantum research and development. Okay. That's a really good sign. They believe in this technology. Yeah. And they're not the only ones on governments, too, all over the world are investing in quantum research. So there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Even it's a little faint right now. Exactly. And the closer we get to solving these technical problems, like with quibit fidelity and algorithms, right. that light is going to get brighter. It's pretty mind-blowing to think that we, we could be entering this whole new era of computing. Hmm. But I got to say, after looking at all these articles, I'm kind of going back and forth between like, this is incredible. Huh. And then wondering if it's all hype, you know. Yeah, I get it. It's a natural reaction to something like this. Quantum computing is such a potentially revolutionary technology. Right. There's bound to be some hype. But we've got to separate that from where things actually stand. Exactly. And that's what this deep dive is all about. So let's get real for a minute. BCG, <laughs> in their report, they actually downgraded their projections for like the near-term value of quantum computing. Why'd they do that? Well, it's a few things. As we've been talking about, Quibit fidelity is a major roadblock. Yeah. Building these quibits that are stable and reliable enough for large-scale computation is tougher than anyone expected. It's like trying to build a house of cards in a hurricane. Right. And then there's the software side, too. Okay. You know, creating these new quantum algorithms and making the current ones better, that takes time. Yeah. And it takes a really deep understanding of both quantum mechanics and the problems you're trying to solve. Right. It's not easy and it's not quick. And on top of all that, you've got classical computing, particularly AI, just making huge leaps forward. It's like the finish line keeps moving while we're still figuring out how to run the race. That's a perfect way to put it. Classical computing isn't just sitting around waiting for quantum to catch up. Right. We're seeing these incredible breakthroughs in AI and machine learning. And in some cases, these advancements are actually solving problems that people thought only quantum computers could handle. Wow. Which is unexpected. But honestly, it's a good thing yeah. because it pushes everybody to innovate even more. So it's not really about quantum computing coming in and replacing classical computing entirely. Right. It's more about them working together, each one doing what it does best. Exactly. It's about having the right tools for the job. All right. Quantum curious comrades, think of it this way. Classical computers are like Swiss army knives, great for everyday tasks. Quantum computers, they're more like lightsabers, overkill for opening a can but perfect for, say, slicing through the fabric of space-time. Or in non-sci-fi terms, cracking complex encryption or simulating molecules. Just don't expect your quantum PC to run Minesweeper anytime soon. Some problems are better suited for classical computers. Others 
Quantum computers will be the way to go. The important thing is understanding the strengths and weaknesses of both. That makes sense. Yeah. So where do we go from here? What are some of the really promising areas of research in quantum computing that we should be watching? One that I'm really excited about is the development of new algorithms. We've barely scratched the surface of what's possible. Right. Every new algorithm we find could unlock new applications and solve problems in ways we never even imagined. It's like discovering a new color or new musical note. Yeah. It opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Exactly. And it's not just algorithms either. There's amazing work being done on improving Quibit technology. Okay. Researchers are exploring totally new ways of building these Quibits, yeah. making them more stable, less prone to errors, and easier to scale up. That's where breakthroughs, like we were talking about before, from the University of Copenhagen could really change things. Oh, right. With the controlled noise in the quantum simulations? Yeah. It's like they're imposing order on chaos. Yeah. It's a radical idea, but it's showing a lot of promise. It just goes to show that we're still in the very early stages of figuring out how to really use the power of quantum mechanics for computation. It's kind of humbling when you think about it. It is. And that's what makes this such a fascinating field to watch. There's a real sense of wonder and possibility that's hard to find anywhere else. Well said. So for our listeners who've been with us on this deep dive into quantum computing, What's the one big takeaway? What should they be thinking about as they follow this rapidly changing field? I think the most important thing to remember is that quantum computing isn't science fiction anymore. It's here. It's real. And it has the potential to transform our world in countless ways. It's not magic, though. It's going to take time, investment, and a lot of hard work to overcome the technical hurdles and really reach its full potential. Exactly. And as we go forward, we've got to be aware of how this technology could impact us, both the good and the bad. We need to make sure that quantum computing is developed and used responsibly in a way that benefits everyone. That's a great point. It's not just about the technology itself. It's about making smart choices about how we use it for the future. Okay. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us on this deep dive. Keep those great questions coming. Stay curious. And who knows, maybe you'll be the one to make the next big quantum leap. There you have it, my fellow quantum adventurers. We're in a race to build the most powerful computers in history, but we might end up with the world's most expensive paperweights. Will China crack the code first? Will quantum computers revolutionize everything or end up as a really cool science fair project? Only time will tell. Until next time, keep your atoms entangled and your qubits. Well, just try to understand what a qubit is. Theodore out.